Here we go with chapter one, the note boom variation. So we're going to start with D4, D5, C4, and we're going to go with the Slav move order. So this will allow us with, for some nice transpositions to our Karo concourse. And now after knight to C3, we're playing E6, and this is a triangle setup. So we have these pawns that kind of form a triangle, and this is the basis of the course. So we do this triangle setup in almost every chapter that we can. And we're going to look for consistency across the different lines. What do you think of this setup? Uh, yeah, so um, I haven't played the triangle system myself, but it has a reputation for being very solid, extremely hard to break down in Black's camp. Um, but So we're playing off that, but we're also looking to, of course, press for an advantage and do something to make our opponents very uncomfortable. So um, we kind of have the best of both the worlds where we can pick if we want to uh, stay solid if maybe we forget the theory and our opponent puts us off, you know, uh, out of book or something. Shouldn't happen. Um, but uh, we can also play for the win in most of these lines. So we're going to be showing uh, really fun variations. And I like that the lines are kind of both strategic and dynamic at the same time. So it's like we're trying to just walk that line between solid and aggressive, right? We're still trying to push for the initiative, but we also want to play solid. So after four, knight f3, this is where we recommend d takes c4. And this is kind of the start of the variation. The idea is we're up a pawn right now, and we may try to just hold on to that pawn. And when we do decide to give the pawn back, hopefully it's in a situation where we get something else in return. Um, and as we'll see, sometimes what we get is connected past pawns running down the a and b files. So this is kind of a fun chapter. So we're going to look at four different moves here for white. Uh, we will look at a4 e4, e3, and g3. So let's start with the main line, and then like in our other courses, and then we'll work our way back to the less common moves. So let's start with uh, a4. Yep, and the idea behind a4 is to uh, basically prevent us from playing b5 and defending this pawn. So white is probably going to follow up with some way to win the pawn. You see this move sometimes. Um, so um, what we're going to do against a4 is play bishop b4, another uh, really kind of thematic way to punish, if you want to do, want to say that word, punish this a4 move. So you notice this uh, b4 square is a big hole, so we're going to put a bishop there, pin the knight, and uh, yeah, very, very uh, slavy type of move there, bishop b4. And this is preparing for us to play b5, because now that the knight is pinned, white can't win the pawn here after takes takes. So yep. we're again trying to hold the pawn. Um, and now we'll look at e3 and e4 here. We'll start with the main line, e3. So white's playing a bit solid. And if they have the chance, they would love to just take this pawn right back. Um, but we are not going <laughs> to let him do that. So yes. we're going to play b5, as Matt just alluded to. Um, if they try to win this pawn, then we just take their king. Um, so that's a nice variation. Um, so uh, instead of hanging their king, white's probably going to uh, break this pin. And uh, now we have uh, white threatening to win this pawn again. So how do we continue from here? So what we're going to do now is we're going to play a5. Because the way white wins the pawn is they first have to play a takes b. So this is by far the most common move here. Now instead of us taking back right away and allowing white to win the b pawn, leaving us with these kind of shattered pawns, we're going to play bishop takes c3 first. And this is an idea that you have to remember. And after bishop takes c3, now we play c takes b5. So again, if you do a count of the pawns, we're only missing one pawn. White's still missing two. So we're up one pawn. And now the way that they try to win this pawn back is playing b3. But how are we going to react to this? Uh, yeah, so we were actually just looking at this before uh, we were recording this video. And my first instinct is like, oh, let's just play b4, bishop moves away, and we get this really strong pass pawn. But the only problem with b4 is they can take, and uh, our pawn is pinned, so we just lose a pawn. So instead of dropping a pawn, we are going to uh, gambit this pawn, actually. So we're going to play bishop b7, and if they take, now we're going to push pass, and we have these passers on the outside wing. So that's what happens. Bishop b7, they take a pawn. Instead of taking back, we push past, and now we have these very strong outside pass pawns that are going to be a long-term advantage. And the thing with this is, like, if you're playing at the grandmaster level, there could be whole books written on the no boom variation, right? But it's actually going to be somewhat rare in your games 
at the club level to see opponents play all the way this deep even into theory. So what we're going to do now is just show you kind of the main line and talk through the plans and hopefully you get enough of these games in your blitz, your rapid, your classical where you get a really good feel for the idea. So if white walks into one of these lines you're ready to push for that advantage. So main move bishop b2 and now we're recommending knight to f6. So the idea here is we want to prevent e4. So in the next few moves that's going to be our goal. We want to get developed prevent e4. After bishop to d3 we recommend castle and then white castles and the plan for white now is rook e1 and e4. All right so what should we do to stop this? <laughs> um, yes so um, we're going to keep developing so we need to get our knight in the game. Doesn't really make sense to go to c6 here because it blocks our bishop and uh, reduces control over e4. Um, white plays rook e1 and now they are threatening to play e4 so how do we take away the e4 square we just plant a knight right there and um, if they take of course we take back and we're going to see what happens if they continue putting pressure on the knight so queen c2 yeah and they're trying to force the issue here they're really trying to get that e4 break if we play knight d to f6 to try to keep a lock on this e4 square it's not quite good enough because what white can do is play knight e5 and then kick us with the f pawn. So now our recommendation is to play f5. We're really trying to keep this square firm. And when we keep these pawns locked on the dark squares, it actually makes the b2 bishop kind of a bad piece. So we have two pawns that are free to run. Right now, white only has the one pawn that looks free to run. And we're hoping that this position is easier to play for black. So main move, c5. Bishop to d5, kind of pointing over at this important queen side. And we have a blockade on the light squares. So what's our plan here going forward? What are we what are we going to try to do from this position? Um, yeah, so as Matt just said, we're going to create this blockade on the on the light squares to make it harder for black to really advance these pawns. Um, we're going to potentially do a... Uh, sorry, I'm, I uh, lost the line. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, like, so we're going to play, yeah, queen c7 here and just uh, threaten this pawn, or uh, I guess pressure this pawn and keep it from advancing. Then we're going to swing our f rook all the way over to b8, so we have really good defense of these pawns and support this pawn push at some point in the future. And one question I was anticipating is, what if white plays bishop c4 and tries to take? We can actually ignore that and take back with the e pawn. Even though we have an isolated pawn on d5 in the end, we're blockading white's pawn still, leaving white with the bad bishop. And then, like Jesse said, our f8 rook is over here. Now we're ready to start advancing. So this is a very dynamic position. The engine says it's about equal. And when you look in the database, black has been scoring over 50% pretty much this whole line. So in practice, at the club level, it's scoring really well. Engine says equal. And we think there's a ton of play, so we're avoiding any kind of dead draw lines. Yeah, this does, definitely doesn't look like a draw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now let's go kind of still down this main line, but we'll look at 15 knight to d2. And typically after this move, instead of going for the e4 break, uh, white might be playing for the f4 break. That's kind of a common plan. So what should we play here? Uh, yeah, so against knight d2 instead of rook e1, uh, we're going to play queen c7. So uh, after f4... Uh, what's the idea behind queen c7? So queen c7, it's kind of a sneaky move. If white plays pawn to e4, what we want to do is play pawn to e5 and create this kind of like dark square bind from our position. So let's say e4, e5, d5. Now look at this bishop on d3, and we're blockading the dark squares. So that's kind of the idea with queen c7. We're still connecting the rooks, like in the main line, but mm -hmm. we're preparing for e4 as well. Um, so probably here you're going to see f4 by white, and now our plan is to play a4, and here we go. These pawns are rolling, rook f8 to b8 is coming next, and we're ready to just kind of push on the queen side and see how white tries to stop it. Yeah, and you see these uh, advanced queen side pawns quite a bit, especially uh, against like uh, when white is gambiting this uh, the pawn after we take, after we take on... Uh... 
wait, after we take on C4, is that right? Um, so this is going to be pretty thematic, and I think you're going to get a lot of exper experience with these types of positions. Really fun to play, and uh, one one slow move from white can cost the game. Yeah. So they got to be very careful. And that's one thing I like about these lines, too, is you know, white could easily just be down a pawn in some of these positions. <laughs> it's like black still has the initiative and everything going for them. So now let's go back to move seven. We looked at bishop to d2 previously. Uh, let's look at knight to e5. And the idea here is it's actually opening up queen to f3, hitting the pawn on f7, and also double attacking the pawn on uh, c6. So very aggressive line by white. How should we reply? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, strong move, and it does pose some threats. So what are we going to do next? We're just going to play knight f3. Um, there's a lot going on here that we need to, <laughs> I think, unpack. Um, so my first question, Matt, uh, no, that pawn's not hanging. So if they take here, we take back. It looks like we're gambiting a pawn. So that's the main line. Let's let's take a look. OK. So a takes b5. If queen f3 is played there, by the way, we can castle out of it. Um, c takes b5. Now queen to f3. So this knight is still pinned. So fortunately, there's no knight takes b5, um, but queen to f3 is definitely the aggressive move, and it's like the reason white plays knight e5, so I would expect mm -hmm. this as a follow-up. But now we have a really cool move. Yep, so, yep, great move. So hanging our own queen, but it's pinned. Um, important to always have an eye out for this move too, because our rook is uh, undefended in the corner, but we can just shore this up very nicely and efficiently uh, with queen d5. Notice how we can't play knight here to lock it down because we just get checkmated. So uh, really the only move here, I guess other than taking the, bishop, or taking the knight, um, queen d5 offering a queen trade. Really nice move. And now the most popular move is not that great of a move, queen to g3. And we see the engine here put the question mark on it. Actually that was my question mark in the notes. <laughs> Yeah. And one thing we do in these courses is we try to show you the most common lines and how to punish them when they're mistakes. So queen g3, slight mistake. And here we're going to castle. And now let's say white tries to get castled. We can play knight to e4, highlighting the fact that that queen is not on a very good square. Hitting the queen and hitting this knight on c3. Um, and now the position is actually winning. Like if we run the engine here, I'm seeing a minus three, minus four advantage already for black. So really white's in bad shape after that mistake. Yeah, this is a clear common threat. We take the knight, they take back, and we get the rook in the corner, or they're going to hand your queen. So uh, very nice double threat here, and that is a 11-move victory. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one where even if you go back here, look at the pawns. We're still up one pawn, right? Yep. It gets on white to try to figure out where's the compensation coming for that pawn. So now we're going to go back to move six. It's so backing up just a little bit. Instead of e3, we're going to look at pawn to e4. And the thing with this difference between uh, e3 and e4, it really highlights kind of the, the stronger players from the club level players. Um, you'll probably see e4 quite a bit because it's just like the nice aggressive looking move. But the problem after e4, and I'm looking at the database right now, when we play b5, Black is winning 54% at the club level to 41 for white. 54 to 41. So it's already scoring really well. Huh. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people play this e4 move because it looks aggressive, they attack the pawn, but they don't really realize that they're gambiting a pawn here. <laughs> and so uh, they feel like they're being aggressive and being playing principled chess when re in reality they're just going a pawn down and they have a little extra space. So uh, as long as we can kind of navigate these middle games, we should be much more comfortable. So yeah. we'll look at A takes first. Does that sound good? Yep. And then we will take back. Take back. Of course, still maintaining this pin. And bishop d2 breaking this pin. So now we are, uh, now white is threatening to, to win the pawn. So we take the knight. They take back. And um, we have this imbalance where we have these nice advanced pawns here, um, but white has the bishop pair. Yep. So something to kind of keep in mind for the entirety of the game, really. That's uh, the major uh, imbalance going forward. And now one interesting thing. 
contrasting this position to when white played e3 instead of e4. Typically, we would look to play a5, b3, b4, right? But in this position, we have an undefended pawn on e4. This is an important move to remember. And black is winning 67%. Knight to f6 develops the knight and hits the pawn on e4. And after e5 is played, now our knight heads to this really nice outpost on d5, hitting the bishop on c3. And the problem for white is they really don't have any compensation now for this extra pawn. Uh, there is no pawn to b3 because this bishop is attacked on c3. And we have a very straightforward plan. We want a castle. We're going to play a5, develop the knight, develop the bishop. And we're just in a pawn up position with potential queenside passer. Nice blockade on d5. I think we have everything here. Yep, and you can see, uh, just like these other lines, is we have a three versus one majority on this swing, so the odds that we get a pass pawn here is just very high. So we really just need to make sure white we don't hang anything and just play play with these pawns. And uh, we're still up a pawn here, by the way. Yeah, it's a, it's a minus two stockfish eval as well. Oh, well. <laughs> so can't complain. So let's look at um, if white tries to get castle quickly. Bishop to e2 on move eight. Uh, yep, so here, instead of bringing the knight out, we're going to fianchetto and kind of hit this pawn in a different way. Queen c2, defending the pawn. Knight f6, uh, extending pressure on the pawn. Um, do you think these moves are kind of interchangeable? They could go either way? Yeah, because what we're threatening is bishop takes knight if white castles, and then win the pawn. Either move order is fine, I think. Okay. Um, and then... Okay, so white needs to defend this pawn tactically, pinning our uh, knight, bishop g5. We're going to kick the bishop, and uh, here we win the bishop pair back. So do we take with the pawn? Uh, take with the queen, actually. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> so now white castles out of the pin, and then pawn to a6. See, you're, we're recording too early for, the, for me to catch the jokes. <laughs> yeah, we're used to recording at night when it's like too late to catch the jokes, and now it's just too early to catch the jokes. Yeah, exactly. But the room, it's brighter in our room, so that's nice. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so let's let's take a look at the imbalances here. Uh, this is something that can help us evaluate the position. So number one, we're up a pawn. Number two, we have the bishop pair. And number three, white center pawns are potentially weak. So what our plan is, is we're going to play castle and knight c6 and try to take advantage of these different imbalances. And if you were to guess the eval, you add those couple imbalances up, you might say, well, it's already like a pawn up at least for black because we're up one in material. And Stockfish confirms it again with a minus two eval. So nice advantage for us. Yeah, in the last two positions, um, white has played all very logical sound moves and they don't know what happened and they're negative two. Um, in Stockfish world, that's borderline winning and white has done really nothing egregious yeah. so it's very easy to wander into a bad position when in the nobu when we captured this pawn early in in our world it might not be borderline winning yet but it means you're having all the fun in the position and you're the one playing for the win right it's still it's your position to lose essentially you have the yeah. advantage yeah and i think of it as uh even if you like make a bad mistake in the future well, now it's an equal position rather than like a minus two position. So you give yourself a lot more wiggle room to make some little mistakes and still have a just fine position. Right. And if they make a little mistake from their minus two, they're, they're probably lost then at that point. Yeah. And I like your point there, Jesse, where um, white is making all these just natural looking moves. And I think that's one of the reasons the note boom scores so well at club level, especially. It's because white plays natural moves. And before you know it, it's a minus two eval. And like you said, white maybe didn't realize how uh, hard it would be to win this pawn back when they first played e3 or e4. Yep. So now let's look at bishop d2. Uh, a takes b5 is more popular at the club level, but this move is actually more precise. So I think it's very important we look at it. We're going to go with our typical plan, a5. And after a takes b5, again, we take the knight. So a lot of consistent themes here. Mm-hmm. Bishop takes back, c takes b, pawn to b3. This is similar to those e3 lines, except again, we can make this a target. So what are we going to play? 
Okay, so the difference between this move earlier is that white played e3 last time. Right. Okay, now they play e4. So what's the difference? Is this e pawn is hanging, e4 pawn is hanging, before it was protected. So we're going to attack this pawn. Um, so if they take here, do we push past and go by go for the same line? And so then if they this take, pawn after. Yeah, if they take, I think we're going to take the e4 pawn right away. Get this important center pawn and hit the bishop. Oh yeah, and it is hitting the bishop too. Okay. Yeah. So white should probably react to that with maybe. Queen c2. I think that was the most popular move at the club level. Okay. And uh, actually, this most popular move is a mistake. Um, so we can continue ramping up pressure on this pawn. So bishop b7. And if they, again, if they push past again, we have the same move. Or no, sl sorry, a slightly different move. Knight e4. So now we're in this uh, nice square and uh, threatening to win the bishop pair, although. Uh, debatable whether we really want to win it um and what and now we're threatening b4 and then we can push past so that's a really strong uh pawn maneuver right there yeah and one thing to note about the knight on e4 versus d5 from e4 we are also hitting this d2 escape square for their bishop so it's just mm -hmm. a little more annoying for white in this case um, after b takes c our recommendation is going to be to castle and what's happening here is this black king is stuck in the center. So let's say white tries to take time to win this. We now have queen c2. That bishop is pinned to the queen. White's in big trouble tactically. Um, rook c1, we have rook c8. And I don't see any way that white's holding on to that piece. Yep. So we'll look at uh, the main line now, bishop to e2. We're going to take that bishop, so eliminate the bishop pair. And now play b4. So again, we get our pawns running. We have uh, equal material in this position, but it's another minus two stockfish advantage <laughs> with those pawns running so quickly and potential weaknesses on, in the center for white. Yep, and a lot of time white wants to just maintain these pawns right here. Um, so if we kind of just poke and prod at them, uh, moves like these, get the rooks over, um, it's going to be annoying and they're going to eventually have to push and anytime they push a pawn it's going to give up a big central square um, so that's a, a nice kind of long-term strategic idea there too so now let's go all the way back here well actually back even further let's go back to move five so we talked about kind of the four different variations we're going to look at uh, and we looked at Let's see, a4 the first time, so now let's look at e4. And this one's going to have a lot of transpositions to the a4 line, and we'll kind of walk you through those now to let you know when to go back to the a4 line. But like if you're studying this in chessable, where you kind of have the position and you make the move, you won't care too much about the positions, because the transpositions, because you will just recognize, like, oh, that position came up, I know what the move is. Mm-hmm. Um, yep, and so there's a lot of similar ideas here, even though a4 has not been played. So again, uh, white is hitting this pawn, and the main idea is just to keep it. So b5, um, one nice thing about the note boom is that we're well guarded kind of on this back rank, when a lot of the times, like in Queen's Gambit accepted, you can run into trouble on this diagonal. But we have no fear, we can protect the pawn with b5. Here's another branching point. So we can either see a4, which is going to basically transpose to the other lines. Um, so I guess we can just quick over that, b4, bishop, uh, bishop b4, and we're in the exact same position as before. Yeah, white just switched a4 and e4 move order. Yeah. So instead of a4, let's look at bishop e2. Yeah, so the reason I went into bishop e2 here is to look at a line that doesn't transpose. Like, let's say white knows that they don't want to play e4 right away, or a4 right away. They may go for this line with bishop e2. Now here, we don't want to play bishop to b4 right away because white can just castle, and there's no tension on this pawn on b5. So really, the bishop on b4 doesn't help us yet. Uh, so I'm recommending the more flexible move here, knight to f6. Because after white castles, then we're happy that maybe we didn't commit the bishop to b4 yet. Yep, and another uh, a vote against bishop b4 is we can always get kicked, and then we're just going to have to move our bishop again. If they have played a4, uh, there's no kicking the bishop. So that's a nice kind of square for the bishop. Um, so they castle, we play 
uh, bishop b7. I like this move because it takes away any uh, problems on this long diagonal, and it's just like a very powerful piece pointing right at the king side. And it guards the rook on a8, so if a4 is played here, we can go a6. Yep. Just defend it. Yep, and then take, take, and we have this nice pawn chain again. Yeah, very right. solid. So let's look at the most common move at club level, bishop to g5. Mm -hmm. We're going to defend with knight b to d7. And at first glance, you might be thinking, oh, what if e5, because this knight is pinned? This is a common idea in a lot of semi-Slav uh, openings. We can play h6 to counter it. And this is actually gaining an advantage for us already. So look at this king on g1. And a lot of times we like kingside pawn storms when they present themselves. That's what we get here, pawn to g5. So now let's uh, take note of the imbalances again. Extra pawn. We have extra space on both flanks. And our king has a chance to either go queenside or stay in the middle, or go kingside. Whereas the white king is already committed to the kingside, and that's right where our attack is coming. Yep, and uh, so I like the idea here of pushing this pawn. It's a central pawn break, and look at that bishop. That's really spicy. Maybe someday we can even put the bishop on d5, have a battery going. And so uh, this expansion uh, isn't always the best you know, plan to go for. But here, we're just really pawn storming. Look how safe our king is. There's just no way they're getting anywhere near it in the next you know, 10 moves or so. Um, so after g5, white is going to sack the knight interesting that's the most this, common the... club level move if bishop g3 we can go knight h5 um, but by a large margin this is the most common club level move and it's a blunder <laughs> so show us what I happens mean, <laughs> yeah so it does look logical because we'll, we'll take back they'll take here and now they have the pin on the knight uh while attacking it um so take take and we have a spicy move here so uh puzzle rush time sort of um if they take here we're losing uh losing a knight so how can we uh how can we prevent this taking here well the answer is queen c7 so if they win the knight bam that's checkmate so a uh, very sneaky kind of peekaboo x-ray checkmate here I like so it. so white does not have time to take the knight and uh, we're sitting pretty. We're going to probably put our knight here in the future. And um, black is really, really strong here. We're probably going to castle queenside, get this rook over here. That looks devastating. Look at these rooks. Look at these bishops. Yeah. So far, I mean, almost every single line we've looked at, we reached the end of the line. And we really liked black's position. You know, we haven't seen many common lines where it's like, oh, white's just completely equalized. Or... I mean, we're playing the black side. We haven't seen any lines where white has an advantage yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's... And uh, this is an excellent bullet variation. You're going to get mate here probably 80% of the time. I'm going to look at the stats. Oh, yeah, I do see an E takes F6 even when we only look at classical or rapid. I see an E takes F6. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back now all the way to that first big branching point. So D takes C4. We have two lines left in the chapter. We're going to look at e3, and then we'll come back around to g3 finally. So let's start with e3, trying to win this pawn with bishop takes c4. So we're going to play b5. Only move to hang on to it. Now a4 will transpose, right? Yep. So uh, we're going to look at one unique line for white here, 6, knight to e5. Okay, so this is a maneuver that's not too uncommon. Um, a lot of the times you see it after a4, and they can win the pawn back with the knight. Um, so uh, let's see what happens after this knight e4. Um, note that we can't uh, develop our knight to challenge it because this pawn drops. That's the but recommendation. <laughs> I like it. Matt, what happens? <laughs> so what happens here is white's, try white's trying to make it difficult for us to do exactly this. Knight to d7. But we're going to ignore this because watch this follow up. Knight takes c6, queen to b6. We're getting quick development and we're going for the initiative. So we gave the pawn back, but this knight's attacked. So white retreats, knight e5. Now we're going to take this knight, doubling the e pawns for white. And we actually have pretty strong pawns here on the queen side. And this d file opened to the queen. So now we can go with a quick bishop to b7. So look at the dynamic play, queenside pawns, that bishop on the diagonal, 
rook d8 coming. Uh, how do you feel about this uh, exchange where we allow that knight takes c6? I'm feeling good about it. Um, <laughs> we also have a weakness here on e5. It's like uh, rem reminding me of the Karokan here. So quick quick plan, attack that uh, pawn, swing the rook over, bishop out, castle. Very easy uh, plan for black. And um, this, is, this is kind of the benefit of go, uh, capturing this early pawn and being up a pawn. We can return the material and look at this huge development advantage. This bishop is incredible. This bishop is pretty terrible. Um, weakness here, no weaknesses in our camp. I'm gonna swing a rook over with tempo. Just like so, so much active play here for black, even if Stockfish doesn't, well, Stockfish does, does like it actually. Yeah, um, slight edge for black. And if you think about the yeah. tempo, white moved that knight one, two, three, four times before it got captured. Mm -hmm. So really it took white quite a bit of time just to win that pawn back. Um, yeah. Now here, the most common move is a mistake by white. So sometimes when you're in a position like this from the white point of view, you kind of feel that pressure come in that we just talked about. And maybe you feel you have to justify your variation by playing aggressive with a move like queen to g4. But now instead of doing the plan that Jesse highlighted, we can develop this knight with a tempo on the queen. So small difference there. And after queen to g5, our recommendation is b4. And this is where we start to see the issues with white's position because after b4, we're hitting this knight on c3, and our pawns are rolling really quickly. And this is a surprising line, but I confirmed it with the engine. We can play pawn to c3 here, threatening pawn to c2. And if <laughs> takes, takes, we have a line that we're going to look at. What happens if white grabs this extra pawn? So this is not a line that you have to memorize. We're going 20 moves deep in this line, but I just wanted to show what can happen in this position bishop to b4, and castle. So right now we're down a pawn, but look at the dynamic play. White's got the king stuck on e1, the bishop on f1, the position is wide open, and their extra pawn is doubled. Mm -hmm. Bishop e2, queen a5. So a double attack on this knight. Rook c1, rook c8. Triple attack on this knight. Castle, and now we secure the piece. And after the exchanges all happen, we're up a knight for the double pawn on e5. So that's just kind of one line to show you what can happen in this variation. I don't, if you're doing this in chessable, you could crop that line short if you want. It's up to you. Like you don't feel like you have to memorize a 20 move line. Um, but I think, you know, going back to this position, white has to be very careful because that's the idea that's coming very quickly. We're just gonna go b4, c3, and push the pawns right up the board. Yeah, I had one question, is what if the knight goes here and kind of slows us down? Oh, we could we play just... uh, queen to a5. Oh yeah, threatening this check. Yeah, we oh, have no. this nice tactic. Well, first we're threatening the knight. So yeah. they may, they have to play like b3 at this point. Now we could go c3, anchor this pawn here. Yeah, okay. And, yeah, that's a good question though, because that's the more aggressive move. People don't want to put the knight back on b1. Yeah. Yep, and then we have the these rooks coming into the game, and then maybe sometime we can back up the queen. I mean, obviously that's a bad move, but back up the queen and support this b-pawn with our a-pawn and really solidify our pawn structure. Yeah, and this is minus four uh, Stockfish eval. <laughs> so again, white's not having much fun according to Stockfish. Yeah, and this queen is doing nothing over here too, so... Um, she Bishop looks nice terrible. though. You know, it looks nice, hitting g7. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty active. Yep. <laughs> basically trading this queen and this bishop which we're happy with yeah so let's go back now to the last line a little bit of a difference from the other lines instead of pushing the e pawns we're going to play g3 by white going for a kingside peon kettle and this is something that you might see from a catalan type player um, but then again i wouldn't expect a catalan player to put the knight on c3 but there will be some similarities Maybe just a confused player. <laughs> yeah, right. They like the Fiend Kettle, but they don't like the Catalan move order. Yeah. So we're going to recommend Knight to D7. And the reason I like this move first is because of this quick pressure coming by white. I think it's more precise than playing something like Knight F6 or Pawn to B5. Like we're putting the Knight on D7 to guard this square E5. And it slows down any sort of like quick advances that white could go for. So now bishop to g2, and we can see this bishop 
has no intention of attacking this pawn on c4. So for now, let's keep developing. Knight g to f6. There hasn't been a4 yet. We don't need a quick b5. Yep, and uh, one awkward thing is if we did play b4, they can play, or sorry, b5, they can play a4, and it gets a little awkward because we don't have this tension. Um, we could put the bishop here and do that same type of plan, but it just is uh, kind of against our repertoire. The difference is that this diagonal is exposed and the rook could be hanging at some point. So we need to be very, very careful of playing a b4 when this bishop is being cut up. Yeah, and now that we have said all that, we will recommend it on the next move. <laughs> so after <laughs> Just, uh, castle, keep it keep it in mind. Yeah, and let's note here that you could you could delay b five. Um, so you could play like bishop e seven first, keep delaying b five a bit. But I'm going to recommend b five here because when White's got all of these pieces already developed, now is the time where they're probably looking to play a four, and we can meet that with b four. And because of the move order that we played with knight f6 first, there's no knight to e4. So that's kind of the reason why I went with this move order. Start with knight f6 guarding e4, because now after a4, b4, there's no knight e4 for white. So that's something to keep in mind. And this is the main line. So a4, b4, and again, white has to decide where to put this knight. Knight to b1 is the most common move, but who likes to play knight b1? Who wants to put the knight back on the starting square? Yep. Yeah. Not me. <laughs> no, so we're recommending bishop to a6. Um, and yeah, here we got this extra pawn. We're really pressing for the advantage. Queen c2. And now Jesse's move from earlier, getting rid of our weak pawn. Not afraid of this diagonal, because we can check that the tactics work. But we're going to trade c for d, and just be up that healthy pawn in the end. So rook d1. Rook c8 is the end of our line. And the plan is bishop e7, castle, knight d5, advance those pawns. Yep, one thing to consider here is it's not super pleasant to take this way in the current position. Maybe white could take with the rook, and now we have this uh, uncomfortable pin. So uh, just uh, make sure you're considering that before breaking this tension. This tension is uh, in our favor now. White really can't do anything, so we'll just wait it out and wait for them to take us so we can develop the tempo. Um, yeah, nice uh, nice position here again. Um, again, we're leaving you in a position that's negative 2.3, so you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you enjoy minus two stockfish evals, you'll like this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next chapter. See ya.